your face very similar to the barmaid in the bar at the Folies Bergère. Like, really? This is, this is it? At least that's what I said when I saw the Mona Lisa. It's very small, as you can see. Um, but when we see a painting, what we see is just the surface, right? We don't really think about what actually creates the color, the tones, the richness of the artifact that we're looking at. And so I am going to ask you to dive below the surface with me today as we start thinking about this now from the artist's perspective. And so when we go and we think about a painting from the artist's perspective, we actually have to engage with it from the bottom up. So what a painting actually looks like underneath all of these different surface levels is something actually a lot more like this. So if we start from the bottom, at the base of any painting is a support or a substrate. That's your, that's your canvas, that's your wooden panel, your parchment, what actually the painting is painted on. And then after you have your, your support, artists will put down a ground layer. And you can, you can think of that as basically just a primer, something that you would prime your wall with before putting your final painting coat on top. And that's basically just to give the artist a nice, smooth surface to paint on. It fills in all of those pores of the warp and weft of the, of the canvas or the pores of the wood panel to give you that nice surface to paint on. Then, very frequently, there will be some sort of underdrawing. You know, artists aren't perfect. They're not just going to freehand everything unless they're Jackson Pollock and just want to scatter art on a, a scatter paint on a painting, right? So very frequently, artists will tend to sketch out what they're going to do on top of this ground layer, usually using something like charcoal or pencil. Um, in some cases, pen, uh, modern days, maybe some ink. On top of this drawing, then, is where the magic happens where all of those paint layers and tones start to build up to actually give us what we see, what we see, the way the light interacts with each of those different materials in the paint layers, as well as the different colorings of the paint layers. And so to dive in a little deeper into what paint actually is, we can break paint down into two main components. The first of which is the pigment. I've shown a, a, some piles of pigments right here, and that's basically an inorganic material. Inorganic simply meaning that it contains metals, metallic components. Um, so it's usually an inorganic material that provides the color to the paint. And so this is actually what's providing the colors that you see in these cross sections here. And then the second main component is the binding material. And that's what's actually the pigment is suspended in and allows the pigment to be spread upon the support, upon the ground layer, over the drawing, the underdrawing. And that's something like an oil or a tempera or acrylic. That's the medium that this painting uh, is made out of. And then uh, very frequently on top is the varnish layer. And the varnish is simply a clear coating that is placed on top of the final work to provide an element of saturation to the painting as a whole. It makes all the colors appear much more richer in tone. Uh, it's not a necessity. Not all works of art have varnish layers, but it is a very common thing to find. And so this whole schematic that I've shown you here, I, I've used this terminology already, this is called a cross section. So we're not looking at, at it on surface, we're looking at it through the depth. And so, this painting, this is actually a part of the Pietro da Cortona painting that I'll be talking about for the crux of my talk. The surface is shown here. It's degraded. There's actually a lot of areas of paint loss, so you can see through to the canvas actually underneath. But when you take a sample, a cross section, so this blue arrow is pointing to where a sample was taken, and trust me, this whole area of loss was not a sample. I'll get into that a little bit later. Actually, I'll get into it right now. These samples are very small. Um, a scale bar right here is 100 microns. So usually these cross sections, these micro samples that we take from paintings to engage cross-sectionally with the painting are usually about 500 microns uh, in width. So basically equivalent to the period at the end of a sentence. That's how small we're talking here. But when we look at this painting in cross-section, we can see everything that I was talking about here with the exception of the support. We have our ground layers, which are usually thick, 
thick brown, red, or white, depending on just what materials the artist had available at the time. Uh, usually these are things like uh, uh, earth-type pigments, so a lot of kaolins, a lot of iron oxides, and that's what gives it that red color. And then the paint layers are built up on top. And sometimes they're very simple and very straightforward, like this one here, where you kind of see two layers of blue, a darker blue and a lighter blue, uh, with a layer of, uh, this is, uh, take my word for it, that's skin tone on top, uh, 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 a pale skin tone. Or you can get as complicated as something like this, where there can be an indecipherable amount of paint layers in here um, with actually an overpaint layer on top. So when you see the paint that goes all the way down to that ground layer, that's actually somebody just took a piece of, uh, took some paint, painted on top all the way down to where there was already an area of loss. So that's why you can see it all the way down. Uh, yes, do you have a question already? I'm sorry. Which paintings resemble this structure or? The, this sample, oh, so this sample is um, uh, from the painting that I'll be talking about later. Um, it's a painting called The Triumph of David by Pietro da Cortona. So, yeah, so I'll get into that later. But yes, so when we, as our conservation scientists, our conservators, when we approach a painting that's about to undergo a conservation campaign or a restoration campaign, there is a specific code of ethics that we have to follow. The first of which is that all non-destructive analyses must be done first and foremost. We don't want to remove samples from the painting. We want to keep the painting as intact and as pristine as we possibly can. So if there's a non-destructive method of analysis, we're gonna do that first. And then, if once we've exhausted all of the information that we can glean from a painting using a non-destructive method, we'll then start to take those microsamples, which is then how we get these cross-sections shown here. So, first, starting with the non-destructive way, non-destructive ways of looking at a painting and analyzing a painting really rely on the way that different ways that different types of light interact with the material of the painting itself. So, let's talk about light. Segways. So, light, most of us think of as just what we can see. Right? I mean, we're talking about paintings. Clearly, color is light. You know, we've got our light from these uh, fluorescent bulbs all around us. But light I, is far more than what the eye can see. In fact, the visible spectrum, these rainbow colors, Roy G. Biff, is actually a minuscule portion of the entirety known as the electromagnetic spectrum, or the spectrum of light. So, we go from incredibly large radio waves all the way down to gamma rays, which are incredibly small in terms of wavelength. So a light can be represented as a wave and as a particle, but for right now we're going to be thinking about it as a wave. And we can define the length of these waves by the wavelength, which is simply from trough to trough or the distance from peak to peak. And the wavelength of a specific wave of light can actually be correlated to this equation. And I'm sorry, uh, something must have gotten lost in translation between PC to Mac. There's always a communication issue there. Uh, but this equation says that the energy of a photon of light, or a unit of light, is equivalent to HC, which is Planck's constant, times the speed of light, divided by the wavelength. So if we know the wavelength, we can know the energy because H and C are constants. So, let's talk about this on a macroscopic scale first. So radio waves, you know, AM, FM, that's light, even though we can also hear it. Microwaves, you know, are just like what's being used in your microwave to cook your food, it's the same way. Infrared, oh, more on microwaves in March, uh, a little teaser for you. So if you're curious about how microwaves can actually be used for chemical analyses, uh, come to the Science Cafe in March. Infrared, uh, or thermal energy, is also a form of light, right? Heat in itself is a form of light. Ultraviolet, uh, or these things that you should never get into, uh, is also a form of light. 
And then finally, x-rays, just like you would get an x-ray scan done at the doctor. And if you're curious as to how uh, we can analyze chemicals with x-rays, there will be more on that in February. So we know these big macroscopic scales of the ways that we interact with light every day, all of these different types of wavelengths and types of light. But now let's zoom in and start to get more of a molecular picture of how light actually interacts with individual molecules. So I'm going to focus on two uh, specific types of light uh, specifically, starting with microwaves. So here we just have a, an image of a water molecule. The red is the oxygen, and the two white spheres are the hydrogens, H2O. And what happens when a microwave radiation hits a specific molecule, and it has a particular energy associated with the photon associated with this rotational movement. So when we hit a molecule with a specific wavelength of microwave radiation, we can induce different types of rotations in a molecule. Similarly, uh, when we move to more uh, higher energy types of photons, we can now start to induce vibrations. And this is kind of the crux of infrared uh, spectroscopy, which I'll get, in, uh, I'll get more into infrared reflectography today. But infrared causes vibrations within a molecule because it's higher in energy, and that's a higher order um, of motion of a molecule. So let's zoom in even more now. We're going to look at kind of an atomistic picture uh, with this diagram here. So what this diagram says is that if we take an atom, and an atom is composed of electrons, and electrons exist in a ground energy state. So everything wants to exist in the lowest energy state it possibly can. Atoms are no different from all of us, where we would all rather be sitting on our couch watching Netflix instead of running a marathon, right? Lowest energy expenditure. So, uh, I guess I speak too grandly there. Maybe, <laughs> not, maybe I'm the only one who would rather be watching Netflix on the couch than running a marathon. Uh, but, uh, travel with me on this journey, if you will. So, we have our electrons that exist in this ground energy state. And if we have a photon or our unit of light that impinges upon this atom, what happens is that an electron, if, if that photon's energy, described by that equation up here, is equivalent to this energy gap between two different energy states, then what we get is an absorption and the promotion of that electron to an excited state. So why am I going into all this depth? Well, it covers another uh, key concept of a way that light can interact with matter. And that, if you remember me saying that, you know, I don't know, 90% of people want to exhibit or want to be in the lowest energy state, electrons also would prefer to be in the lowest energy state. This electron doesn't want to be in this excited energy level, this higher energy level. And so what happens is it relaxes back down to that ground state and now emits a photon in the process because you now have the opposite equivalency where that energy of the gap, the energy that that electron relaxed down to, is now the energy of the photon that is emitted. And this is a process called fluorescence and is very similar to what you would see in a glow stick. All right? So I'm going to be talking about fluorescence a little bit later, a little bit more into the nitty gritty. But these are some of the key concepts that light can, uh, of how light interacts with matter. Absorption and fluorescence. So, how does this actually now all apply to paintings? So I've uh, drawn, uh, I've got a little schematic of that cross-sectional representation that we saw a couple slides previously, where we have our support, our ground layer, some underdrawing, some paint layers, and a varnish. Obviously these layers are not to scale, it's easier in PowerPoint if you just copy paste layers. So, let's turn this sideways now. So now we've got the support here, the same color coding schematic, and the varnish up here. So let's first analyze our painting with ultraviolet light. Well, what happens is ultraviolet gets stopped by this varnish layer because varnish readily absorbs this ultraviolet light and fluoresces, and we can actually see that. 
So if we take an example, this is Madonna suckling the child by a, an artist of the Ferrarasi school. This is a, a 16th century uh, oil on wood. And what we see, this is what we would see in the museum, right? This is what's hanging on the wall. But when we look at it under ultraviolet light or black light, this is what we see. And so what we're seeing is the presence of varnish. That blue light is that fluorescent process happening within the varnish as it's absorbing the ultraviolet light and emitting a purple blue light. And then these areas of dark splotches are areas of very degraded varnish where that process no longer happens. All right? So we can use ultraviolet light to kind of see even more extreme on the surface to something that would normally be invisible to the naked eye. Because if you remember, varnish is normally a clear coating. Right? So now we can actually detect its presence with ultraviolet light. But I've told you that we are going to see through paintings, so seeing what's on top of a painting isn't really relevant. Right? Yes, what's up? Uh, I'm just curious, once varnish darkens, does that in any way impact on the uh, ability for the uh, light, the ultraviolet light to pass through it? Sure. So the question was, once the uh, varnish is tarnished uh, and degraded, does that uh, prevent or alter the way that light can interact with the surface and the way that the light goes through it? And the answer is, I will show you the impact of degraded varnish when we get to the uh, case study. Thank you. Yeah. So let's start looking through paintings. So first, we're going to go to the infrared. The infrared actually penetrates down, so we're calling uh, infrared is now lower in energy than ultraviolet light. Infrared penetrates all the way down to this underdrawing layer. So the underdrawing layer it penetrates all the way down to the underdrawing and is absorbed by the underdrawing, specifically if this underdrawing is made with charcoal or pencil. Because charcoal, pencil, that's all just carbon. Lots of carbon-carbon bonds exist there. And infrared light loves carbon-carbon bonds. So what happens is when we, when we image with infrared light, we shine an infrared light source on the front of the painting and collect the infrared light that's reflected back from this ground layer. Because the, and then we're looking for the absence of that reflected back infrared light in our images to see through to maybe if we can see through to those original sketches by the artist. So that light comes back, gets detected by a cute little IR camera here. And then finally, we can also use x-rays. X-rays now are even higher in energy than ultraviolet light and can actually penetrate all the way through to the, uh, through, even through the support. Just like you can imagine when you get an x-ray done to your hand, as that example goes, the x-ray is able to penetrate all the way through your hand and not cause any damage to your, paint, uh, to, your, <laughs> to your hand. Hopefully you don't have a painting on your hand. But it can also go through a painting as well in the same construct. And then we'll detect it on the, on the back side. All right, so what does that actually look like? Well, I have a Picasso for you here uh, as an example. Picasso is a bit more exciting than Pietro da Cortona to some. So here's what we would see on the wall on the museum. This color image of uh, Le Gourmet, which is done by Pablo Picasso in 1901. If we were to look at it in infrared light, depending on the wavelength, on, and, uh, uh, and therefore depending on the energy of the light that we're detecting, if we go to a, a, a slightly higher energy or a shorter wavelength, this 1050 nanometers, we can start to see the traces of something else that might lie under the surface, but it's not immediately clear. Mostly we just see the same little girl again uh, playing with her, her kitchen. But if we go down to lower energy, something that's more in the absorption region of carbon-carbon bonds, we can now see that there's an entire hooded figure originally sketched by Picasso underneath the surface. That he decided, eh, little girls cooking. That's probably gonna sell better, right? I don't know what he was thinking. Maybe that's just one option, one telling of history. 
So then, now if we look at it in x-ray, going to extremely high energy photons, we can actually start to see that he had gone so far as to paint aspects of that hooded figure. And we know that because x-rays are absorbed by high density elements. That's why when you see an x-ray of your skin, you're looking at the calcium in your bones, right? So here, what we're actually detecting are elements like lead, like mercury. Lead white is an incredibly common pigment used throughout, throughout our history. And lead white is most commonly used as the base for a lot of artists' flesh tongues. So, in this region of very high density, so in this case, white light, or, or white means the presence of that material we're looking for, corresponds really well to this woman's face. The hood, it could be anything, you know, it could, there could be traces of, of lead in there, there could be traces of mercury if it's a red hood, so a red pigment being a mercuric sulfide or cinnabar, vermilion. But we really don't know, because the imaging process doesn't really give us any chemical specificity more than infrared shows me organic and x-ray shows me inorganic. So that's why we move to something called X-ray fluorescence. X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. So we're gonna go back to this original, uh, this original diagram that I showed you when we were talking about the ways that light can interact with matter. And I'm just gonna repeat it. We have a photon, the ground state electron. If the energy is just right, we've got that Goldilocks energy level, we'll promote that electron up to the excited state. Now, if we go away from the atoms perspective, well, well, we're still in the atoms perspective, but now we have a much more complex atom. So if you suspend disbelief with me for a second, and let's pretend that the Bohr model is correct, we have these shells around a nucleus. And the shells around the atom's nucleus are the different areas in which the electron exists. If you have a multi-electron atom, you know, like anything above hydrogen, you have these different shells. Uh, well, I'll say above helium, because helium still only has one shell, right? <laughs> so, if we have now, so this, this will call this a really, a moderate intensity photon. You know, we'll call that, that's a red photon, a uh, yellow photon. It's yellow, so we'll call it a yellow photon. Visible light, right? But now if we have a really high energy photon, something like a pho photon of an X-ray, and that hits our sample now, what actually can happen is that photon is of such high energy that there's no energy level for that electron to get excited to. Instead, it just flies off. It's ejected from the atom, and it leaves a hole behind. So now jumping back to this perspective here, if the electron relaxes back down, we get a photon that gets emitted, right? The same process now can happen here where an electron lying in this outer shell ring, which exists at a higher potential energy, can relax down to fill that hole that's been created by the vacated electron. And since that energy gap is much, 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 much smaller than the X-ray that we used to kick that electron out in the first place, we get a photon that's emitted of some lower energy. And that energy that gets emitted by that relaxation process is something that's very specific to individual atoms. Because each individual atom has a very specific set of energy levels for those shells. So the way that we monitor this non-destructively is using something that looks a lot like a Star Trek phaser gun. So this is an XR, a portable XRF, and it's simply a point and shoot. I can hold it, point it at a painting, and it will tell me what fluorescent photons are coming back after hitting the painting with a particular energy x-ray. And now I want to stress that this is how we can look at pigments. This type of, of, of instrument is really only good at looking at inorganic species, inorganic elements, so those metallic elements. So basically ignore this like top two rows of the periodic table, and we can look at everything else underneath. So, uh, what that means, then, is if we have three mysterious piles of powder, 
Two of them are white, one of them is yellow. I don't have chemical vision, so I don't know which one's which. But if I were to take that XRF, I would detect lead in this pile of powder. I would detect titanium in this one. And then I would detect lead and chromium in that one. And so from that information, I can then back correlate to figure out what pigment that is. So I know that this pile of white powder is most likely a lead white, which is a, lead, a basic lead carbonate, which has been used since antiquity. We have record of it being used since as early as 400 BCE. This pile of titanium, on the other hand, is most likely titanium or titanium dioxide, known in the, in the artist's world as titanium white. And that has really only been used as a pigment since 1921. So if I were to find titania on, say, a Leonardo da Vinci, I would know that something funky is happening, right? Something funky is happening. And then, similarly, with lead and chromium, I can correlate that to chrome yellow, which is a lead chromate, which is another artificial pigment that's been in use in the artist's palette since about 1816, commercially. So not only can we get pigment identification, but we can start to also do some date authentication correlation aspects as well. So uh, enough about the fundamentals. Let's get to some stuff that's near and dear to my heart. So this is the painting that I've been alluding to this whole talk. This is the presentation of David to King Saul after slaying Goliath. Uh, we colloquially refer to it as the triumph of David. And I'm sure most of us are familiar with the, uh, the well-told story of David slaying Goliath with a, only a sling and a rock. This actually depicts the aftermath of that event. So, yes, that is Goliath's head on a pike. It has been cut off by someone, I think it was probably David. Uh, and so David here is being presented to King Saul by Abner as this wild procession of revelers celebrate and rejoice behind him as other soldiers carry Goliath's head on a pike. So uh, we do have a Kristen for scale. Uh, this is not me, this is the other Kristen involved in the project, uh, our head conservator, uh, Kristen De Gataldi, who decided as a part of her PhD uh, at the University of Delaware in preservation studies to undertake this monstrosity that is 12 feet tall by 19 feet across. And yes, it looks kind of ugly right now, right? So uh, this was, uh, oh, I should say, this is traditionally attributed to Pietro da Cortona, who is a Baroque era artist. This is done in uh, 1630, we believe, circa 1630. But yes, so this kind of Instagram filter effect is what I like to call it, this yellowing that you see on the surface, that's the effect of degraded varnish. It's not that clear, nicely saturated tones. Instead, we get the Instagram filter. And you'll also see that there are really dark areas of paint. And that's really, really degraded, what we now know as overpaint, or something where somebody else came along and decided to paint over it. Somebody that wasn't the artist, because it's made of a different material. Right? So I'm a big fan of context. And I know this is a science cafe, but I love the art history of this painting, and I, I'm going to share little tidbits of it with you uh, tonight, if that's okay. If you'll, we'll forego the science for just a little bit, just one slide, I promise. So, this painting uh, found its way to Villanova University thanks to one Princess Eugenia Rispoli. Uh, do not be fooled by the name. Uh, she was born Jenny Berry of Rome, Georgia. So she is uh, an American, what we know as a dollar princess. So she was a part of the, of the group who uh, inherited a lot of money and decided to take all of her money and marry uh, royalty overseas <laughs> because the royalty were kind of falling onto hard times financially. There's, this is a subplot of Downton Abbey, if you watch Downton Abbey, right? So... Jenny Berry actually inherited all of her money from her first husband, who was a tobacco factory millionaire in Georgia. Actually, no, sorry, in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, then when her husband died a few years later, she inherited all of his money. 
and decided to go to Italy and marry Don Enrico Raspoli and officially changed her name to Eugenia, which was uh, a more common and fanciful name at the time. So that's how we get Princess Eugenia Raspoli. And when she lived in Italy from 1901 to about 1930s, she wanted to turn their, their castle, Castle Nemi, into an art historical institute for both Americans and Italians. And so she spent a lot of her life collecting art from all over the place, including this painting, The Triumph of David. But she moved back to the United States before the onset of World War II to a, to a fancy apartment in New York City and took with her 90% of her paintings. In World War II, the, uh, there was a large battle around the area of Rome in which Castle Nemi was actually bombed, the Battle of Nemi. And so for a very long time, we believed that this painting was present in the castle uh, at the time of this bombing and had been left exposed to the elements for, for years before it found its way to Villanova. But, according to Monuments Man, Ernest T. DeVault, so if you've ever seen Monuments Man, the movie, uh, this is a, a figure in the movie, he found his way to Castle Nemi and noted how the Luftwaffe had actually taken it over and had destroyed every artifact in the building. All the furniture was slashed, any remaining paintings slashed to ribbons. So then we got to thinking, huh, well then maybe it wasn't in Castle Nemi because then this would have been destroyed. But there's no record of it entering into the United States with that original shipment to her sister Martha, who still lived in Georgia. So there are some theories that this painting, in, in all of its gigantic form, was somehow smuggled into the United States and found its way into one of her storage containers in New York City. But we do have conflicting evidence from her adopted daughter, who herself married a Russian prince, it's a complicated family, uh, who said that, no, 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 four paintings remained unharmed, four of them. So it's possible that this painting was there. It was one of the four. It's still a mystery. It's still a very active uh, research subject at Villanova University. But to make a very long story shorter, uh, it found its way to Villanova University. Uh, she donated a bunch of paintings to the university um, a couple months before her death, uh, which was not uncommon. She had been slowly trying to donate her collection to different Catholic universities um, and around the country, mostly at uh, Barry College, which is now named after her family. Uh, but uh, a handful found their way to Villanova in 1951. The Berry family uh, generously uh, also donated the money for a restoration campaign to be done to the painting. So this is what it looked like at the time of its initial donation. This is the old Falvey wing of the library at Villanova University's campus. And the, the restoration though is not quite what we would think of today as a restoration. Restoration in this case was they, played, they paid a framing gallery to just put a new coat of shellac on, right? So that's what we see here, some, some workers from the framing gallery putting just a new coat of varnish right on top. And it kind of did the trick for a while. This is uh, what it looks like when it was officially put on display in 1956, uh, albeit in black and white. But you don't see any of those gross degraded areas that I had pointed out previously. It looks pretty okay. Everything's saturated and filled in. Then comes 2013, where it now looks like this in color, suddenly, right? So, it now looks like this. We've got that Instagram filter, we've now got these degraded areas popping back out, and so the conservation campaign began. And like all good conservation campaigns, we first started with our non-destructive modes of analysis. So, let's hop right in and start with some infrared reflectography. So this is where we're looking at those under drawings using a relatively low wavelength of light, low energy, uh, sorry, long wavelength, low energy. <laughs> so this is what you would see on the wall of Old Falvey. Uh, we call this figure the Crouching Woman. She's one of the processional uh, women figures on the right of the painting. When we look at it at two different wavelengths of infrared light, we actually start to see that she was originally uh, painted and drawn more in profile. So she originally was looking more at David instead of kind of this overway, uh, away and down 
type of look. And you can see her, her hook nose, and it doesn't look too pleasant from this one, right? So kind of much better here, even though she's got a weird uh, 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 tear going on. <laughs> then if we start to look at the soldier's feet, again, this is what you would see on the wall. Right now it's a normal amount of feet. You know, every foot seems to have a leg. It seems okay, right? Okay. It's not like Goliath where we're chopping off his feet now, right? Just having them paraded about. But when we look at it in infrared light, we see that there are lots of feet that don't have homes. So the artist wasn't really sure where to place those soldiers that were holding Goliath's head. And we can start to see evidence of that when we look at it with infrared light instead of with just the visible. So, uh, just to remind you again, here is what the painting looked like when we began. Uh, this is the crouching woman figure that I was uh, talking about on the previous slide, and all of the feet down here. So, uh, in infrared, it looks like this. And so I just want to point out a couple of key areas to you. First, we have Abner, whose helmet was originally very fancy have lots of feathers. We go back to the original. There's no feathers. He's not fancy. So we've got lots of fancy plumes on, uh, on Abner's helmet that were originally there and not in the final. Now if we look at King David, uh, oh, I always mess that up. King Saul. This is King Saul. His crown was initially placed a little higher on his head. So this is where it is in the final painting, what we would see. And this is where it was originally all the way up there. Now one area I want to draw your attention to that doesn't look like much now is this area down here. So this is the foot of the throne that King Saul is sitting upon. There's a, a page boy right here, a shield being held by this soldier. But not lots going on there, right? It's kind of just an empty space of the painting. So let's go to a different imaging source. Let's go to x-rays. Suddenly, there's a whole figure there when we start to look at it with x-radiation. So if we zoom in on this figure in that same location, here he is. His face, his shoulders, his hand. He's kneeling at the foot of the throne of the king. So why this guy was painted over, we really have no clue. Um, Nothing from the art history um, would suggest uh, uh, as to why this would be uh, painted out in the final composition. One theory, though, is if you look at what this guy is holding in his hands. It's a bundle of sticks. So you can see the sticks here. And an axe blade. The axe blade is over here. He's kind of like holding it on the blade, which really isn't the same as they can do, right? But that actually is, that's called a fasces. And at the time, was the symbol of Rome. The fasces was the symbol of Rome. And today, we've co-opted it uh, for the United States. That's what the eagle is holding in one talon, a bundle of sticks with the blade. Basically, to symbolize, if we are all unified, we are much stronger than if we were a one single stick. So, a theory is, is that the original patron of the painting, the guy who provided the bucks for the artist to actually do the thing, right? That probably the patron was uh, was a prominent figure in Rome at the time, maybe. Um, but was painted over. Maybe there was some falling out. It's all just guesswork at this point, right? So, uh, what else can we see if we start to look at this with X-rays? Um, going back to the crouching woman figure, you can kind of see her here again uh, in profile. So he had even gone so far as to to paint her in profile, her nose here. We actually see the figure of a child <laughs> peeking out underneath the elbow of another dancing figure. And there is a child in the final composition of the painting, but not here. It's actually on the other side of the crouching woman, and I'll point that child out to you a little bit later. So, hidden child peeking out. We also see that David was not too bright uh, because he was originally holding his sword upside down. <laughs> so, up here, that's the hilt, right? The hilt of the sword was originally up here, but he got it right in the end, uh, is uh, holding it so as not to hurt himself. So, 
can we get from the painting? We've got these really great images. We're able to unlock some of the things that are hiding underneath. But again, we haven't unlocked any of that chemical specificity. Right? We don't know what pigments are being used yet, what painting materials. So that's where we go now to XRF, or the X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. And so I've just shown here what the, the spit out of that phaser gun looks like. But if we interpret that sum, what we see is that if we point the XRF instrument at the yellow tunic of this soldier, what we predominantly see is barium and chromium. And that suggests the presence of barium white, which was originally available as a pigment in the 1830s, and chrome yellow, that lead chromate that I was talking about earlier, which wasn't available until 1816. So this suggests the presence of a lot of modern material in this area. And barium sulfate, uh, barium white, was, was very frequently used as an extender, a way of toning down the color of chrome yellow. But now, if we look at the red cloak of this soldier, basically all we see is mercury, a little bit of sulfur. And this indicates vermilion, or cinnabar, which is mercuric sulfide, which is a pigment that has been used in antiquity. So fun fact, if you're a museum, you're surrounded by lead and mercury all the time. All right, facts you needed to know, right? Anyway, so, but that doesn't tell us really anything, right? We've got, we've got a pigment that's been used since antiquity at the bottom, but basically only modern pigments at the top. So while we have our chemical specificity, we don't know anything about the stratigraphy, right? Or the layering of those paints, where those pigments, where in the cross-section those pigments actually reside. So, this is now where we start to microsample. So, we'll take this crouching woman figure again as an example. Uh, here's that other child, the child that was actually in the, in the final version of the painting. The, the, the peeping child was over here. And so if we zoom in on her elbow, and then zoom in even more, this blue triangle shows where this cross section was taken. And if you look at it, Originally, that's where her skirt was. Her skirt was higher up on her elbow. And so you can see that through all of the blues underneath those skin tone colors. And up here, that's the, that's the varnish, that very yellowed material. That's what gives her that weird tan effect. So now we can look at this with a, a very fancy microscope called a scanning electron microscope. And we get this image here. So we're now we're zooming in even further into the image. And what a scanning electron microscope allows us to do, or an SEM, is that whole X-ray fluorescence process, but now we can map those elements on this microsample. So this is, they call it something arbitrarily different, EDX, or energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, but it's the same exact thing. <laughs> Except for we're using electrons to get the photons out instead of X-rays to get the photons out. So now, if we start to do those fluorescent elemental maps, let's look at aluminum as an example. And it's a little hard to see here, but uh, take my word for it, there's a band of red, very concentrated red here, that corresponds to the concentrated presence of aluminum. And so we know that aluminum is predominantly in this thick, dark blue layer here. And aluminum is most commonly found in lake-type pigments. Uh, a lake is simply uh, an organic dye that's been bound to aluminum. But we also, and now you'll just have to take my word for it because it's a little hard to see, there's also a thin, fainter band of aluminum right here along this, this layer, this layer up here. But what we notice is when we go to another element, this time sulfur, we see a lot of sulfur in these upper regions, and that's indicative of vermilion. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a red that was commonly used to tint that white to get the flesh tones that an artist wanted. But then we also see a lot of sulfur in the blue layers. And the co-presence of aluminum and sulfur indicates the presence of a fancy mineral known as lapis lazuli which was at the time the most expensive pigment available to artists because it came from one mine in Afghanistan. 
And so that's why, if you look at uh, uh, antiquity uh, portrayals of Christ or the Virgin Mary, they're usually wearing blue sashes or blue robes because they wanted to paint those figures with the most expensive material they could find to show their value. And so what that tells us is if all of that lapis lazuli was used there and then covered up, whoever paid for this painting had a lot of money, right? A lot of money. Because it wasn't until the modern era, around the mid-1800s, where lapis lazuli started to become artificially synthesized as the pigment ultramarine. And now it's commonly available. Now nobody cares. Right? It's easy to get. But so that's another fun fact about the painting, that we, can only, we would only be able to see if we delved into the depths. Because if we were to just do an X, uh, an, a portable XRF, that Star Trek gun at this elbow, all we would see is lead and mercury. But now we can actually go in and see it more clearly. So to kind of wrap things up in the interest of a Q&A session, I've gone well beyond my time here. Uh, we have our electromagnetic spectrum of lots of wavelengths of light that we just can't see. But we can still use those wavelengths of light in order to see below the surface of a painting. We have the visible light to give us our initial sense. Infrared to allow us to see the underdrawings underneath the painting. X-ray to see even what the infrared can't see, including entirely painted hidden figures. And then we can microsample and start to get a sense of the layering of the painting. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank all these folks, uh, the folks primarily that worked with me on this project at Villanova. I would also like to greatly thank Shepard Reed and Aaron for allowing the uh, <laughs> Professional Chemistry Fraternity of Alpha Chi Sigma the opportunity to do this Science Cafe series for you. We're all very excited about it. Um, and so here are some, some paintings, uh, some photographs from the project, and I will leave you with this. Uh, this is the painting when we began the conservation campaign in 2013. This was the painting after all of that varnish had been removed, as well as all of that overpaint that we had found from previous undocumented people attempting restoration campaigns. So that's what all that red spot is. That's just filled in canvas now. And then as of today, if you were to go to the old Falvey wing at the library, this is what it would look like hanging up on the wall. So with that, I will happily take any questions. Thank you. What a fascinating story behind that painting. Um, and for those of you who haven't been to Science Cafes before, uh, if you'll raise your hand, I'll bring you the microphone, and you can ask the question using the microphone, and that way everybody hears the question. If you prefer not to, to ask your own question, you can raise your hand and tell me your question, and I'll ask it for you. Um, and so I see a hand went right up in the back there, and I will get to the hands in the order that I see them Go up to the best of my ability. There's a there's an urgent question back here, so I'm gonna get back. Here. Do you do the restoration by duplicating the original paint, or by removing just removing foreign elements, all these overlays? So the first stage of of any conservation process is to remove uh, the unoriginal material. So in the case of this painting, we actually found a lot of that unoriginal material, um, evidenced by that one cross section that I showed you where the paint went all the way down to that empty canvas spot. Um, and so their conservators will use a whole host of different solvents and, and mechanical and chemical cleaning mechanisms to get that off. And then in terms of how to fill that in now, if you have a lot of those areas, uh, those gaps of flaked off pigment um, and paint, uh, what happens is actually in the case of this painting, if we go back here, um, so this, these red splotches are uh, where the conservators attempt to match the, the ground layer. So the ground layer for this painting was a very rich red composed of a lot of kaolin, which is just clay and iron oxide. So it's a very iron rich and that's what gives it that red tone. But before they actually put that red paint down, they put a thin coat of varnish um, on top once all of the unoriginal material had been removed. And that's a clue for when future conservators now come back to this painting to say, okay, now it's well documented and we see here's the intervention layer, right? So here's where now the, uh, the conservator's interpretation begins. 
Um, and then from that point out, um, instead of using the, uh, sometimes the original pigments are used, um, but more frequently because the original pigments might be too expensive or uh, uh, certain newer synth synthetic pigments can match the color, but they're a lot cheaper to get. Um, those will be used then to match the colors in the areas to the best of their ability, and then a fresh coat of varnish is applied on top of everything. Interesting. I did. I know there was another hand. So here's one. Here we go. Do you know if any of those painters suffered from lead or chronic lead or mercury poisoning? That is a great question, and that's actually one of the theories as to why Van Gogh went crazy. Um, actually, is so he had the bad habit of licking his paintbrushes, and so around the time of the post-impressionist era. A lot of cadmium paints started coming into existence. So cadmium yellows, cadmium reds. Uh, and those are you know, similar levels of, of toxicity. And so when he would lick his paintbrushes filled with cadmium yellow and cadmium red, there's theories that he gave himself heavy metal poisoning. Um, but a lot of these materials, unless they were ingested, they wouldn't be. But if you eat them, they're not be. But yeah. Them, them just being on a painting, it's fine. So, but yeah, there are theories that if people had, if artists had those, um, those, those habits of painting, of licking the paintbrush with the paint still on it, you'd be very easily. Uh, Shepard, I think there was one behind you. Uh, um, in some of the images, it looks like there was a crease in the original canvas. Um, is there a theory that it may have been folded? Yes, so um, you can actually still see the crease here, um, right along the middle. So as you can imagine, uh, in the 1630s, people weren't probably manufacturing canvas of this size regularly. So that's actually the seam line of sewing two pieces of canvas together. Um, but yes, uh, so there is evidence of um, it have, having been taken off the stretcher, which is what holds the painting in place underneath the frame. Um, and being taken off and restretched, possibly some rolling, which is how it would have been smuggled if it was smuggled in the first place, or, or transported in general. I'm sure you can imagine that doesn't transport very well. Um, but yeah, so so there is evidence of restretching, but uh, that crease is a, is a canvas seam line and not a folding. Thank you. Do we have right here? Do you ever look at the, the stretching process and how it kind of breaks apart the pigments and things like that? Um, and does it degrade paintings more by having it stretched and things like that? Sure, yeah, so the, the question for those of you who might not have been able to hear was, does the stretching, re-stretching process impact the painting? And the answer is yes. Um, uh, that's why uh, a lot of conservators encourage um, uh, professionals to restretch it like themselves. Um, so uh, a lot of times, uh, so stretchers are made out of wood. They're just wooden bars. And so if, for example, uh, an insect infestation had happened, it can happen that the stretcher degrades, um, but the painting is perfectly fine. And so a lot of caution does need to be used in terms of restretching. Um, and uh, yeah, and it, and it can cause um, some breakage if the paint is already very fugitive. If it's already very fragile and flaky. Um, but before, usually before that happens, conservators try to do the best they can to consolidate um, uh, the paint to prevent it from, from flaking off before restretching. So if it's done improperly, then yes. If it's done properly, hopefully no. Thank you. Do we have other? Over here. Right here. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just curious what you think are one or two of the most exciting uh, discoveries that have been made using these same techniques. Mm. Um, so the um, the Picasso, I think, is, is particularly exciting. Uh, but using these techniques, that's actually how we, we were able to find that Van Gogh actually did this very frequently. Um, if anyone's seen, uh, there's a, there's a Doctor Who episode about Vincent Van Gogh, um, and there's there's that new there's that new movie that came out, the oil painted movie called Loving Vincent, um, where at times when he was desperate and just needed to paint, but he didn't have the money, he would just take an old painting, put a new 
ground layer on it and then paint back on top. And now we can unlock and see those hidden paintings that in his times of desperation, we can, uh, he had to paint over. Um, and so there's actually a really wonderful, uh, if you're ever in Amsterdam, uh, <laughs> there's a wonderful exhibit at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam um, dedicated to just the imaging of Van Gogh paintings. And you can uh, see through to the underside um, in that case. Uh, but yeah, so those, those would probably be my favorite too. Over here. Has this type of analysis been done on like, every painting that's in the museum, or just certain ones that desperately need the conservation efforts? So um, the analysis gets done when the curator decides it's time for it to get done. Um, so for most, pe uh, so the answer is no. There are many, many paintings that have not been imaged um, like this, um, because most frequently for like the lesser known paintings. Um, they only get imaged when they're taken down to either get put back in storage or to have a conservation effort done on them. So it's kind of done in tandem with conservation. But there are a lot of big ticket paintings that get imaged more frequently than others. <laughs> so something like the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa has been imaged extensively. And part of that is in to, to also provide further evidence for authentications of other Mona Lisas that start popping up in random places. Um, uh, another example um, would be the, uh, uh, oh, the the anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tool, I believe it's called. It's a large painting that uh, is rotated between um, uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the University of Pennsylvania's uh, Museum of Art and Archaeology. Um, and uh, there's a fun story with that one specifically, and that whenever a new uh, paintings conservator comes up uh, the, uh, as the new head of the department at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, it's their rite of passage to do a conservation campaign on the anatomy lesson <laughs> of Dr. Nicholas Duell. Um So <laughs> things like that get done more frequently. Um, but yeah, so there are still plenty of paintings that would need to be imaged and probably new discoveries would happen uh, if, if they were to do that. Okay, I'll be short. Um, we've, we've been to Europe and seen many of your paintings, and this is just fabulous, understanding the science that goes behind all of these works, that we've seen, as you say, the different wavelengths and so on. But I really appreciate the fact that you're sharing that with us this evening. That is just fabulous, because now we have a much deeper understanding of what is going on. So thank you very much. Thank you. I really thank you. appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Uh, this this work brings me such joy, uh, and I'm glad you find it as interesting as I do. Given all the science you have available to you, would it be possible for a forger to duplicate a famous painting that would be undetectable? That is a very good question. Um, so uh, if the forger knew what they were doing, um, the answer is probably. So, um, so in terms of authentication, um, science is not actually the first pass for authentication. Um, art historians are the first pass for, uh, for authentication. Um, because no matter how obscure the artist, there is an art historian somewhere that has dedicated <laughs> their life to that artist. And so they could look at a painting and be like, eh, that brush stroke is in the wrong place. The, the artist wouldn't have done it like that. And so usually they're the, they're the first gateway. And so if the art historian then says, eh, you know, maybe, probably, um, that's when the science comes in. And so very good forgers um, probably could. So there are other things besides just, uh, I mean, obviously if the, if the forger was gonna use titanium white instead of lead white, we would know like that. Um, but, you know, if maybe a forger is able to get their hands on original pigments, um, not from the store, they would have to go out and find them and hand grind them themselves because that's another aspect of synthetic pigments because they're made by machines are often very, very finely and homogeneously ground. Uh, but pigments way back in the 15, 14, 1600s, you would have had to mold them yourself. Um, so collect them from your sources, mold them yourself so they're very heterogeneously ground. And that's why you get like big chunks of pigment particles in some of those paint layers. So if they were able to do that, 
Um, if they were to know the intricacies of the artist as well as the art historian and the conservators and the conservation scientists, then it could be done. Um, there actually is a case of someone who forged, I think, 10 Rembrandt paintings. Um, and Rembrandt's um, are, they're, they're exquisite paintings. He was an exquisite artist, died much too, too young. Um, and so there are not that many Rembrandt's. Oh, wait, no, that's Vermeer's. Rembrandt is still great. Um, <laughs> this is Vermeer. That's Vermeer that I was talking about. But Rembrandt, no, so, okay, so, so uh, for, a forger of, of Rembrandt, um, who was known for his very uh, good way of manipulating light in a very Baroque uh, fashion. Um, but so this forger, um, he was brought to trial because nobody believed him that he had actually forged these. So he actually like, came out and said, yeah, I, I forged them. And there was a whole trial in which in the trial, even the art historians didn't believe him. Uh, and so he actually, in the court, had to prove himself by, by, by doing his forgery right there in the courtroom. So that's a fun story. You can look it up on Wikipedia or something. But uh, yeah, so it's possible, but you would have to be very, very good at what you do. Very, very good. Because there are a lot of checkpoints along the way. Fascinating. And looking around for any other hands. I'm not seeing any go up, so that means I get to ask questions. Um, so, uh, do you know how I, the, these these techniques for analysis of materials probably were around for other uses before they started using them to look beneath the surface of paintings? Um, do you know who thought of, hey, we could look at a painting that way? Do you know kind of the origins of using these techniques to look at paintings? My best answer to that question would be scientists trying to get grant money. <laughs> um, yeah, so you know, you're absolutely right. A lot of these techniques have been used for a, a wide host of other fields. Um, the, the, XR, the portable XRF, as an example, um, is most commonly used to go find uh, precious metal in junkyards. So people will take this and just like scope around to find where the gold and the platinum is at junkyards. Um, so yeah, so, so some of these techniques, is, the more modern ones, um, have original sources. So there are some very cutting edge research groups that have taken the tools that they use daily and have thought, huh, you know, so, for example, there's a group at Duke um, who's doing uh, something called pump probe spectroscopy or microscopy, um, in which they're trying to actually see through, and I actually have a slide of this. Okay. Um, so, where they're actually trying to create a, a virtual cross section using light. Um, but this came from, this whole pump probe microscopy setup came from uh, looking at eyeballs. So uh, this type of imaging is very frequently used to create a virtual cross-section of, of eyeballs before uh, eye surgery. And so the thought was, you know, if this works on something as delicate as an eye tissue, why not use it for a painting? So that's where a lot of these ideas come from. Fascinating. And how, how did you find your way to this particular form of scientific investigation? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. So um, uh, I went to a small liberal arts university in South Carolina called Furman University. Um, and when I went to school, I thought, I'm going to be a lawyer. Um, <laughs> uh, and all I need to get into law school are good grades and a good score on your LSATs. And I'm good at chemistry, so I'm going to major in chemistry. I took my first political science class, got a B, and said, no thank you. Um, so I was like, okay, well, why don't, I, why don't I try forensic science? That sounds pretty cool, you know, CSI, why not, right? Very glamorous. So uh, I, I started doing research uh, the summer after my freshman year at this university, and at Furman, um, we have this thing called the Chemistry Corporate Luncheon. Um, and I found myself sitting at a table with a gentleman who owned his own independent microscopy company. Um, and I was excited to talk to him because I was like, hey, you know, microscopy, you, you do a lot of collaborative work with forensic science. And so we were chatting and he was like, you know, there's a lot of aspects of forensic science that people don't even think about. And I was like, oh yeah, do tell. Uh, and he said, for example, the whole field of art conservation science, to which I just kind of did one of those, like, freeze frames. 
Um, because I had taken a couple art history classes in high school, loved it, have no artistic talent whatsoever, so I would not be the one touching up these paintings or forging paintings or, or whatnot. Um, but I've always had like a love of art and art history. So the, the prospect of being able to combine both my love of science and chemistry and my love of art into a field just seemed like too good to pass up, I mean, too good to be true, really, even. Um, so yeah, so after that, I uh, uh, was very fortunate to have an advisor who knew a guy who knew a guy, uh, who uh, was able to get me an internship in uh, a conservation lab in France where I was working on 13th century sculptures and a first century shipwreck that had been excavated and fell in love from that point on. Uh, so yeah, um, my end game goal once I get my PhD is to work for a museum as a conservation scientist. So if you know anybody, let me know. <laughs> I've got about two more years left here though, so that's okay. All right, well, I'm glad I asked that question. <laughs> That's a good story. And last chance, last call. Anybody with one last question? No. Well, thank you so much. You what a fascinating presentation. And I, I should know this off the top of my head, but I have to look at the brochure, and I encourage everybody to take a brochure. I'm realizing. Reading glasses. It's Kara Saunders. It's Kara Saunders, thank you. Next month. And what is going to be the title of her talk? The title of her talk will be X ray vision observing crystals at the atomic level. And she's actually in the audience. And there she is now. <laughs> so that'll be fascinating too. Please join us next month for the Science Cafe. Please come up and get your uh, brochures. It has the full schedule of this cafe and the other cafes. Um, and uh, we also have some Land Rover rack cards here. Uh, your lucky day. So have a great month. Until next month, we hope to see you again. And uh, have a very good night. Thank you. Thank you.
Understand the science behind it, behind rather than just you know, what's yeah. so interesting is looking at the, the under images of oh, the sketches. Absolutely. I've seen those, so, but it's like yeah. I understand the different wavelengths that you use right, like to pull out trait, those yeah. images. Yeah, yeah, that is just really so, I'm that so, anyhow, yeah, this is just a great. Yeah. I really liked it. Yeah, yeah. she yeah. did a great job. Yeah. She did. She yeah. really yeah. did. I'm sure yeah. someone will sample it. I appreciate that. <laughs> 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 so, what kind of cancer are you Inorganic. Yeah. Catalyst. Yeah. Catalyst. Yeah. 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 What's my life duty? So anyhow, we. Wait, we were talking. Oh, you're. Oh, you're talking before. Okay. <laughs> good. Good. Yeah. Well, we hope to come down. So we got the schedule. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We'll be here for all of them. Yeah. 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 I know all of the topics. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. That's how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>